thanks everybody for coming. Um, so we're celebrating the Curacao. We're also gonna to try to talk about other adaptations of Shakespeare, including the Joel Cohen one. I dressed in shades of black and white and gray to try to accommodate the fact that there's that peculiar determination in spite of the blood soaked aspect of this play to somehow never have any red visible in it. So at, as Rinka was saying, uh, in the mid 1950s, the great Japanese director Akira Kurosawa, best known for masterpieces like The Seven Samurai and Rashomon, began working on an adaptation of Shakespeare's Macbeth, transposing from medieval Scotland to medieval Japan, this whole tale of the heroic warrior tricked by supernatural prophecies and an ambitious wife into a violent and ultimately futile usurpation of power. Kurosawa had wanted to undertake this project for a number of years, but it kept getting set back partly by a 1948 Orson Welles version of the play we might get back to, which with a lot of sort of big budget Halloween atmospherics and a disastrous attempt to mimic medieval Scottish pronunciation that obliged him to redub the entire soundtrack was not a success. Kurosawa's version, which has been given the cheesy title Throne of Blood for its American release, but the Japanese title would be better translated as Spiderweb's Castle, which I guess I'm allowed to do this, huh? Is that why people are giving me funny looks? I wasn't sure. There's any number of reasons why I lecture. Well, <laughs> people do that. So, so this has emerged as a kind of classic, I think, in both the world of Shakespeare and the world of cinema. It was only mildly profitable for the Toe studios in Japan who thought they could sort of pick up on a growing market for samurai movies while keeping the international art house audience that he had earned um, with Rashomon in 1950. And by the way, the, the, most, the, the recent Hollywood movie based on the book by our colleague, Eric Jaeger, member of the center, uh, The Last Duel, does a very nice Rashomon <laughs> trick with telling that story. In any case, the impact of Throne of Blood in the West was remarkable. Readers of Time Magazine, which was then the most popular magazine in America, were told it was, quote, the most brilliant and original attempt ever made to put Shakespeare in pictures. It said that Kurosawa must be numbered with Sergei Eisenstein and D.W. Griffith among the supreme creators of the cinema. Gregory Kozintsev, the most famous Russian Shakespeare director, called it the finest of Shakespeare movies. T.S. Eliot reportedly identified Throne of Blood as his favorite movie, or by some other tellings, just his favorite Shakespeare movie, or at least as presenting his favorite Lady Macbeth. And you can understand if you watch the movie why the Lady Macbeth is just stunning. Harold Bloom's best-selling study of Shakespeare called it the most successful film version of Macbeth, and lots of scholars of Renaissance literature concur, and I certainly do, because if a friend had not dragged me uh, to a midnight dining hall film club showing of this beaten up black and white version of Samurai Macbeth. I just don't know if I would be able to be here being a Shakespeare professor. Uh, so you never know quite what's going to work. Well, the question is, how can a play so deeply invested in the poetics of its language succeed as a translation into a verbally sparse Japanese film? The title, for example, of, of the title characters, uh, the first line, the translation and the subtitles of the characters, first line, uh, so fair and foul a day I've not seen in, in the movie comes out as, ugh, what weather, which is possibly a diminishment. But although some of Kurosawa's collaborators say that none of them really looked at Shakespeare's play, it seems to me that can't possibly be true because he consistently finds all kinds of fascinating verbal, a visual equivalents to what's going on in the verbal intricacies of the play and also drew in some very large moral and existential ideas that Shakespeare articulates. I'd say the dominant theme of the film, which I think also underlines Shakespeare's version, is this futile struggle of the human self against nature. Kurosawa condemns that doomed battle of human pride and desire against an indifferent universe of overpowering weight and scope and persistence while simultaneously mourning the suffering of the human spirits trapped into waging that impossible battle. This may seem like an oddly universalizing moral from the perspective of 21st century scholarship that prefers to emphasize differences among cultures, but I think Kurosawa's film highlights analogies, in this case, analogies between British and Japanese medieval history and between Shakespeare as an epitome of high Western civilization and Japanese no drama as an epitome of high Japanese civilization. So the film that way asserts a truth about human condition that largely transcends historical boundaries. Its opening chorus tells us that what was once so still now is true. 
and that the spirit of the doomed warrior in the film, it says, is walking still. And I think the film then proves just how broadly applicable that moral of the story is. And this struggle of the vain, reflexive human will certainly is present also in Shakespeare's Macbeth. But I think in Macbeth, that pessimism is mitigated, probably characteristically of Shakespeare, by a contrary suggestion, in this case, a suggestion of a more positive kind of determinism that harmonizes with Christian perspectives. As divine providence ends up defending Scotland's virtuous linear royal inheritance through the medium of the natural order. Kurosawa, I think, pays less attention to that optimistic view. He emphasizes the more malign aspects of both political and supernatural control. And he consistently employs visual effects, visual aspects of his medium to reinforce a message that depending on the cultural position of the viewer, have a kind of Buddhist or nihilist implication. Kurosawa's film adaptation thus shifts, I think, from Shakespeare's theological and psychological exploration of the nature of evil toward a dark meditation on existential entrapment that I think is lurking in Shakespeare's version also, and he brilliantly excavates. Some commentators see Spider's Web Forest, the main place of this play, as they say, a supernatural labyrinth. But I think for creatures aware of their own mortality, nature is itself a force no less terrifying and overwhelming than evil deities. Some spiders inject poison, but others just wait around for their captives to die in the webbing. And in some ways, you can say the biosphere may be doing that with homo sapiens, but I don't mean to be too depressing today. But the stubborn resistance of the natural order against human will, depicted mostly as a blessing in Shakespeare's tragedy, becomes in Kurosawa's version an assault on our desires for control and transcendence desires which prove to be nearly as blind as the biosphere that defeats them. One commentator accuses Throne of Blood of imposing what he calls a simplification of the moral framework of Shakespeare's tragedy by replacing the Western concern for the individual soul with the rigid social ethic of feudal Japan, which encouraged obedience within a well-defined framework of social and political obligations. But I think the film does something else. I think the film achieves its deepest complexities by keeping those cultural values in tension not least by the contrast between the wildness of the forest on the one hand and the well-defined framework of the human dwellings and their clean rectilinear designs on the other. That tension gets reinforced by the juxtaposition in the style of the film's performances and storytelling of on the one hand, modern Western psychological realism, and on the other hand, the traditional no theater masks and movements, which Kurosawa actually used to train his actors in some of the facial expressions they ought to be using. The tension would have been very important in the Sengoku period depicted in this film, also in The Seven Samurai a couple of years before and Hidden Fortress shortly after. This was roughly the century preceding the birth, the birth of Shakespeare. It was half a world away, and it was an agony, agonized period characterized by warring samurai factions, multiple phases of the overthrow of leaders by their supposed subordinates. And the tension between traditional authority and individual self-assertion would have been extremely important during the years this Macbeth version was produced. During, during the years, I'm sorry, that, that Macbeth, the original Macbeth was produced during the late Renaissance upheaval of social economic order from a stabilizing feudal system of identity and status to the rapidly urbanizing world of London and capitalism and colonialism and world trade, a world full of self-made men, the Getty Nuova, the new men that caused so much anxiety as sort of a revolutionary tradition coming out of Italy in this period, and the civil wars over the English throne that Shakespeare kept showing as so destructive and bloody and that had threateningly at least been renewed as dangers by the recent accession of King James to the throne. And in fact, very recently before he writes the play, apparently uh, by the gunpowder plot attempt to overthrow the government on behalf of the wars of religion. Intriguingly similar dynamics, I think were at work in Japan during the years Kurosawa was making Throne of Blood. Imperial Japan's defeat in the Second World War and the American occupation broke down the tradition bound dictates of Japanese culture and introduced instead a Western emphasis on the revolutionary concept of the individual self. As so often, the force of an artwork de derives exactly from its ability to evoke from the past an apt cautionary tale for the present without any explicit local political program. And the dynamics even of this director's technique in the opening scenes, so can we go to the slides on this? The old monarchy here is set in a very flat kind of standard shot, uncharacteristically symmetrical 
Um, and there's a great, it, it's shot, there, there are various ways that Kurosawa is in effect giving a kind of passivity. And what it sets up in the opening scene is a contrast between the sort of wild determined energies of Washizu, the Macbeth figure of the play, played by Kurosawa's perennial leading man, Toshiro Mifune, his success in kind of restoring emotion and motion to the seated body of the great Lord Suzuki, the equivalent of King Duncan. Washizu is always followed by a moving camera, whereas the great Lord is always shown in these static compositions. And I think Emperor Hirohito's failure in World War II would have been coded in the passivity of the great Lord in the face of imminent defeat. And the force of Western modern consumerism would have been visible in the blind hunger of Washizu, who doesn't quite yet recognize the deadly labyrinth into which it might be leading him and can't quite understand, in fact, right up to his dying moment, how he was caught, as tragic heroes often are, between the commands of two conflicting cultural imperatives. As Kurosawa states in his autobiography, the Japanese see self-assertion as amoral and self-sacrifice as the sensible course to take in life. Sorry, Japanese see self-assertion as immoral and self-sacrifice as the sensible course to take in life. We were accustomed to this teaching and never thought to question it. I felt that without the establishment of the self as a positive value, there could be no freedom and no democracy. Well, Kurosawa, I mean, Kurosawa was known as the emperor by many of the people he worked with, and that was not entirely a compliment. He was somebody who clearly had a lot of difficulty relinquishing the most exact kind of control over everything that he was creating. It's a real contrast that he could never achieve kind of the kind of tranquil resignation, the relinquishing of control and resignation to the transience of the world that characterizes the films of another great film director of his time and place, uh, Yashijiro Ozu. Kurosawa evidently saw that the drive for dominion, which he knew only too well, led Japan into an ocean of bloodshed that resulted only in the national devastation epitomized by Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Their ground as raised and ash black as the, the, the silt, the site of Spider's Web Castle on the slopes of Mount Fuji, where they were filmed. The very fact that the Throne of Blood begins with a retrospective chorus initiates the disturbing theme of scripted fate. Yet we all must know that in some sense, even if we resist considering it, the distant future is sure to offer a similarly dismissive retrospect on any of our lives. Forcing ourselves to recognize this tragic scripting brings into focus the reflexive denial of fadedness and futility that most of us as viewers share with the Washizu Macbeth figure. Yet within the dark world, and I think Stephen and I are gonna debate a little or discuss a little about this, I think that there remains as the composition of many shots remind us, a few brighter moments that there's room still for laughter, there's still room for loyalty, good hearted companionship and hope for the renewal of life. Central to this film's ethical argument, I think, is the implication that recognizing the inevitability of death doesn't have to entail the poisonous fate that Washizu was tricked into choosing for himself. Two years before Throne of Blood, during that 1950s period of intense anxiety about nuclear annihilation, I think Deborah and I have compared notes about this, um, Ingmar Bergman's great film, The Seventh Seal, similarly balanced the night's grim chess game with death against the sweet domestic hopefulness of a young couple whom the knight is able to protect by dauntlessly playing out a losing position. Watanabe, the protagonist of Kurosawa's wonderful 1952 movie, Ikiru, meaning to live, knows that he's dying, but the film warns that submission to the hierarchical bureaucratic rituals of Japanese life in which Watanabe has wasted decades, in effect forbidding himself to be fully alive, is not a great answer to human mortality, nor is the total lurid indulgence of the self, the self in sexual indulgences and in heavy dr drinking that are part of his first line of resistance when he gets his terminal diagnosis. Instead, he finally achieves a kind of selfless assertion of the self, an insistence on a personal vision and morality that serves the larger project of human nurture and joy represented by the protective mothers he guides tirelessly through the bureaucratic maze as they seek to have a pond of toxic waste converted into a park and by the children who eventually fill that park with exuberant life and laughter. As Macbeth, the fundamental, as in Macbeth, the fundamental fundamental force resisting the project of human individuals in Throne of Blood is seemingly the benevolent order of nature itself in all its patience and its complexity. 
human beings still tend to endorse the idea of a morally intelligent creation in which we have to obey the dictates of nature. And yet we must all, as Lady Asashi, the Lady Macbeth figure in the movie, convinces her husband, and we somehow have to make war on nature to survive. And to some extent, we need to burn trees, turn them into fire for heat and manufacturing or into houses. Feathers have to be turned into weapons as they become here in Throne of Blood in the flight of wooden arrows, plants and maybe animals into food. But like many great works of art, Throne of Blood is a profoundly ambivalent exploration of human morality that's once intensely located in its time and place and it's transhistorical. And it's deeply self-conscious about its medium. As in the catharsis that Aristotle recognized as a crucial function of tragedy, the despondency of Throne of Blood seems morally charged, not itself a nothingness, but a call on our self-overcoming and spiritual heroism, even in the blank face of doom. So after a minute of gorgeously composed shots of barren, misswept Mount Fuji, reminiscent of the Suiboko ink painting that Kurosawa himself did, he begins the human story with a subtle self-deprecating irony. He follows the opening credits. Here we can go to the next slide, culminating in his own um, at the top with a picture of a series of grave markers of people who died, uh, presumably in the castle being portrayed here. And the similarity between these things um, actually continues if we go on to the next slide. This is each wanting to be read alphabetically down a set of five characters with this marker of the place where cobweb, spiderweb castle supposedly stood. It just says, this is, here stood cobweb castle. But the marker is there, it's old, it's worn, uh, it seems to be abandoned, uh, but it does declare itself as a gravestone, a gravestone of the film whose name it bears and announces the film as a gravestone of the world that it reconstructs. The slab in this case marks the site of the long erased castle through which the film's characters materialize all their transient claims to glory. The accompanying chant that goes with this, the soundtrack, echoes some standard Buddhist precepts about the transience of worldly aims and acquisitions, and it will be essentially replicated in the song of the forest spirit who's the equivalent of Shakespeare's Three Witches. And it's then repeated to close the film. And as reinforced by the open ground where the great castle once stood, the warning also corresponds to a haiku by Basho, probably Shakespeare's, uh, Japan's greatest 17th century poet as Shakespeare was England's, writing in a genre again Kurosawa himself practiced, and apparently inspired by visiting an old battlefield. Just said something like, summer grass, all that's left of warrior's dreams. In some ways, the literary text behind the ironic impact of this erasure may be less Shakespeare's Macbeth than Shelley's Ozymandias. The film's opening landscape is dim and barren, the weather is dull and bleak, and the dust and fog blow through like the equivalent of Shelley's sandstorms. There's no human individual voice and all that survives is that obelisk surrounded by nameless graves. So the Buddhist lessons of Mujakan, impermanence and mu, nothingness are conveyed by the artistic deployment of empty space, Q. A combination of the visual and auditory techniques, the flattening of the telephoto lens I talked about at the beginning there, the deadening of the treble in the sound palette that was done quite deliberately, all that augments a certain depressive force of the opening sequence. They correspond to Kurosawa's rejection, in fact, of the original set design of the buildings. It was very tall kinds of buildings, like we see those huge tall spaces, by the way, in the Cohen Macbeth, giving a very different kind of signal. Instead, this is a world that tamps down anything that tries to rise up out of the ordinary, any aspirations to ascendancy. Almost every walk and ride we see, in fact, in the movie is uphill, like that Escher staircase image that we all had on sort of college posters or something like that. I think gravity becomes the unseen antagonist of the heroic human story in this movie. And so we get instead these low interior spaces that Kurosawa insisted on as part of an ongoing contrast between human aspirations, intense but finally trivial, and the world in geological time, which seems passive but is finally overwhelming, right? Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in the petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. Where Shakespeare opens with the vivid weird sisters, suggesting this power of the supernatural over the play and Macbeth, Kurosawa frames his story instead with the blank superior power of the natural, which has long since erased the glorious structure for which we're about to see people struggle so desperately. And I think the Cohen movie actually 
compromises on this whole question by starting with the weird sister kind of, the sisters kind of, but turning them into birds before we really recognize them as anything human. So the, that passivity of the great Lord echoes the kind of emasculation of Shakespeare's King Duncan, who's repeatedly unable to defend himself. And it's set against the heroic effort of the messengers rushing up to give the news and the warriors they praise, Macbeth and Banquo, Washizu and Captain Mickey. We then see them on these desperately striving, riding horses. Um, but what happens is interesting. If we go ahead by a slide, one of the things I wanted to point out is not only this kind of compression, but all through this film, you see, especially Wasizu here on the right, in grids. He's got these rectilinear structures that are constantly framing him. And in this case, it's some arrows in the chamber where his wife is in the process of getting him to commit the murder. Can we go to our next slide? And when he's trying to control, when news comes in that Burnham Wood is moving, he tries to control it by looking at it again through a series of these slots. We go to another one. But this is what he's trying to watch, and it's fantastically hypnotic in the actual film. These treetops are all swirling, and the fog is swirling around them. And there's simply no way to take control of that level of, of chaos. And we can do one more slide. Um, that's a ground view of what it looks like, again, advancing in. We do one more. And there's Watanabe in, uh, in the Akiru movie, who, again, sitting at his desk, is surrounded by all these piles of papers that are vertical and horizontal. But mark the way that this sort of human rectilinearity is failing to capture something that we need about life. One more slide. Oh, yeah, one more. And here's the forest spirit that they meet. There are a few things to say about this. One is her enclosure is a weird mixture of the natural and the rectilinear. And again, this can't be accidental. And you get the kind of sheath hanging down. You've got these, the sides are these vertical slats. And she's in the middle there and she's spinning a spinning wheel. But I think it's not accidental that that spinning wheel looks a very much like, at least those of us who are old enough to have seen one, a movie camera. Um, it's another moment of the sort of self-referentiality that Kurosawa is practicing. And it, it, it's not a completely just random cute signal because it has to do also with the fact that she's telling them their fate is already determined. It's all there, like the beginning of the movie. It's telling this movie, this story has already been told. It's all already recorded. And you are just being given a glimpse of it, but that also makes them, makes them play into it. Can we do one more slide? Um, so yeah, I'll get back to this um, in a moment. But in a lot of the scenes early on, Banquo and Macbeth are shot through a huge tangle of leaves, of vines. And lots of times, Kurosawa actually pulls the focus back such that you're focused instead on the vines and these blurry characters moving around aren't very important. The vines are there. There's something gradually dripping off of there. But it's, you get the sense continuously that this kind of tangle is going to be inescapable. And it's sort of chastening reminder that the heroic story in our lives may not be the most fundamental story about it. And the chaos of life at some point or other will wipe out and wait out human creations as somewhat the great recent novel, The Overstory by Richard Ford, seems to me to give a similar message about trees. So we get this visual tension established early on between these things. Um, Washizu and Miki ride off through the rain, accompanied, by the way, by a fantastic westernized, you know, trumpet blare of the heroic charge. Um, but after about 20 seconds, it gets wiped out um, by the laughter that comes in from somewhere at the skies at their efforts, because they are saying, I will use my arrows, I'll use my spear to defeat whatever evil spirit has me lost here in the forest. But there's nothing, it's a, sort of an intensely perfect emblem of human futility to imagine that they can attack the weather and defeat the forest uh, by, by doing that. Um, Kurosawa's framing is always very tactical. When they encounter the forest spirit, all the shots keep them nicely paired. You can't see them well. We'll see them better in the next couple of pictures. Yet when the spirit recites to each of them their individual fates, which are gonna put them in conflict with each other, the shot instead shows them with the Farah's spirit separately. Um, and we can go on to uh, the next one here, please. Uh, there she is, uh, or maybe she, I think she. Um, and there they are again on either side. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Um, and there is the forest spirit when she meets the Macbeth again late in the play, surrounded. And you know, the, the, what's happened here is that Macbeth Wishizu has said to her, 
you need to tell me the outcome of my battle. And she bursts into laughter because the outcome of everybody's battle is right there. And in the previous scene, it's been there too. And we'll get a look at that. Just these mounds of human, of human skulls. Um, and she finds it hilarious. And it's kind of bleak humor that I think is, is attacking us also. Can we go to the next slide? Um, and when she disappears in that first scene, they come around and they find in place of her hut, again, these mounds of death. And you can see the way the symmetry of those two skulls at the top are kind of like Washizu and Miki here, but they, can, they don't understand quite the messages that they're being given. Can we get a next slide? Um, and it's interesting that there's just a great moment to watch in the film when Captain Miki Banquo knows that Macbeth has killed the great Lord, but decides for pragmatic reasons, he has to let him back into the castle. And he's turning away with a look of disgust on his face. We get so many shots of them face to face, and now they're in an ominous opposition to each other. We do another slide. Um, so many fantastic visuals in this scene, which is the scene where the king, the great Lord is gonna reward them for having saved him against the rebels. But Kurosawa sets it up so that first of all, both of their heads are below him in the low camera angle shot um, as they begin. But once he's given Washizu Macbeth, the new title of Thane of Cotter that makes him think his great fate is coming, he comes back and he's actually above him. Vanquo over here is below him. Same thing happens with him, but his sword is consistently, you see it straight up against the great Lord's son, who is going to be the rival of his son for control of the throne. So this is the kind of signal that the, the, the setting up, the detailed setting up that Kurosawa does gives us so much emphasis on. Um, we go to a next slide. And here they are walking out, um, both again now suddenly looking much larger than the other. Um, and they're just, there's a wonderful sequence when you get to watch it of them each once barely daring to look across at each other at the fact that these predicted fates for them already seem to be underway. Can we go to a next, please? Um, another trick is that this is just before the forest spirit disappears after giving them the prophecy. Uh, she goes as the wind kind of blows. All you can see is her cloak and then she's gone. And if we do the next slide, this is Lady Asaji, Lady Macbeth, as she disappears into the other room to get the sake, she's gonna drug the grooms so she can get the murder. And she goes back into there eerily and completely disappears. These figures are all matched up, in other words, in cinematographic ways, the same way Shakespeare's language in the plays keeps giving us hints that they're gonna use because they use the same language about things like um, doubling over and over again. So uh, let's go ahead, another slide. Uh, another moment, I just, what I love about this is, this is after everything has clearly gone wrong um, and Washizu Macbeth is here, is, He's, he's enraged at himself and he's sort of in this room with these barren trophies, his, his sword and his crown. And he just keeps yelling, fool, fool, which is sort of the equivalent of the whole magnificent tomorrow and tomorrow sequence, right? And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. But it's all there, but you kind of get the message, uh, even the way Kurosawa presents it here. Um, so um, let's go to the next one. Uh, just a moment of sort of the human arrogance. You get a close up of these people bragging that they're now the kings of this castle and so important, but he sets up the shot so you see how big the mountain and the clouds are against them. Next one, please. And here comes the death of Washizu, spoiler, um, uh, turned back into this kind of porcupine creature that he is um, by that. Um, and both versions end up with the castle, but Kurosawa's version again seems to be gloomier because it refuses to compromise the promise of natural time with Shakespeare's concessions to a human chronicle, a chronicle to honor, in fact, his most important audience, King James of Scotland, who wanted to believe uh, that history was pointing forward to him. So Shakespeare at the end, well, in the middle, has Macbeth shown a line of Scottish kings in the future that stretch out to the crack of doom, Whereas Kurosawa shows us instead the bare, bleak, worn, abandoned marker saying only that the castle is gone. Both versions, I think, reveal also a more literal, pragmatic level behind the seeming supernatural signal 
of Burnham Wood advancing against the castle. Obviously, what we learn is that the trees were being chopped down, so branches to provide camouflage for the army advancing to try to defeat the Macbeth creature. But I think there may be even a more basic message behind that pragmatic one. Untold ages ago, presumably land was cleared to make human habitation, to create later agriculture as we reshape the world to suit and serve our needs. In fact, in Scotland, shipbuilding caused the first extensive deforestation during the reign of the historical Macbeth, and the initiation of iron smelting rapidly increased that during uh, the time that Shakespeare was writing this play. And certainly erosion and gravity, if nothing else, is going to erase our structures. Wild vegetation will reclaim the land. So I think the frame of throne of blood constitutes a lesson for human, the human race conveyed by something like a sort of deep time lapse photography. A lesson could bring us some peace in a Zen Buddhist mode, but at the price of a kind of humility that doesn't come to us easily, thinking our grand thoughts, you know, in these grand rooms. So while the mining of old artistic so-called masterpieces for humane wisdom, durable wisdom may be out of fashion, I think these lessons of Throne of Blood remain pretty interesting. Our oceans, as happens in the 2003 Indian film adaptation, Macbool, and less explicitly in the 1995 uh, Malagasy uh, Maki Befo, now seem more likely the oceans than our forests, maybe to overcome us in the near future, to invade our houses. And the refugees from our deforestation may be persons rather than birds, as they are in a, another very interesting moment in the movie. But I think their warning remains applicable. The underlying horrifying blunder is devaluing a just and sustainable community with one's fellow humans and the rest of nature, and instead converting life into a ruthless competition in which only the most brutal can thrive, and only the chilly barren symbols of power like that sword and headpiece are valued. And it's become, I think, even more, more important and relevant in an era of neoliberal economics, resurgent strongman political leaders, gender reactionaries, and myopic views of the biosphere that alone sustain us with that nothing valued in this world that can't be monetized. I think Throne of Blood builds a bridge between the tragedy of Macbeth and the socio-political malfunction now called the tragedy of the commons. Even leaving aside the environmental crisis, what happy ending can really be expected from blind greed and domineering, from ambition that eclipses rather than embraces happiness, and from a devaluation of peaceful cooperation in a species whose very survival depends on it. Kurosawa's movies have been decried by a lot of um, generational critics as being too old-fashionedly humanistic and sentimental, but I think the worldview taking hold in many purportedly enlightened and democratic nations lately suggests that human and empathetic tendencies are hardly the greatest threat to justice and joy of life. And every time I revisit this classic film, it seems to me more and more up to date. So that's my rant about that. Uh, <laughs> let me turn it over to Stephen. Thank you, Rob. That was terrific. Um, I discovered uh, recently looking over, brushing up on my imdb.com information that there have been an enormously larger number of Macbeth uh, offshoot films than I thought I ever knew about. Um, so their childless couple is the center of the, of the film and this, this, movie, this play has so many offspring. It's unbelievable. Um, I'm going to talk about a very narrow bandwidth of the family tree of Macbeth. It uh, enters uh, American cinema through a film called, uh, pretty straightforward in its allusion, Joe Macbeth. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about that. And it sort of is the grandfather of the noir allusion in the film. It, uh, Throne of Blood is 57, Rob, is that? Yeah. Yeah. So Joe Mc. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I'm not. I'm not going to uh, attribute a knowledge of it to Kurosawa, which would louder. Oh, well, I can try to use this. Then. Maybe just do this. Is that? Am I better now? Okay. Ah, very good. Okay. Um, but I mean, one 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 point to make is that <clears throat> Macbeth was was um, having offspring from very early on the Davenant uh, rewriting and wholesale revision of the of the play, recognizably descended from Macbeth, and that is a piece of uh, restoration uh, theater history. Um, Joe Macbeth and I, I have brought a um, an original. <clears throat> uh, 
this, this is something the studio sent to a movie theater and trying to get it to buy various promotional uh, things to hang up in the, in the lobby. Uh, I will point out a couple of things in a moment. Um, but it, it had a very difficult path to the screen. Uh, the first draft of the screenplay was completed in 1945 and submitted to the authorities. This would be the PCA, Production Code Administration. And um, I think of them as the, as the Office of the Revels. They were on the lookout for seditious, um, otherwise reprehensible or offensive material and would um, send it back. Uh, when initially vetted by the production code, the objection was raised to the screenplay, quote, at no time is there any suggestion that the forces of law function or even exist in this country. Now that was sufficient to reject the script, but at the same time, it seems to me that that's, that implies the script captured a, a, an essential part <laughs> of, of Macbeth, something, something uh, very clearly uh, featured there. Uh, two years later, they get a re uh, revision of it, and they still reject it, although one member of the production code board named Charles Metzger makes a remarkable suggestion for improving it in such a way as to make it acceptable to the authorities. Um, he says, quote, this whole story might be told as a play presented by the convicts of some prison as their version of Shakespeare's Macbeth. It's like Stoppard or something, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and they, later he compliments his own idea by saying, this neat and illusory conceit gives a saving flavor to the script, which will render it acceptable. So you make this movie, but you make it the way I, <laughs> I'm proposing to do. Um, I guess as long as, long as the play is, uh, the action of the play is presented as the product of a criminal intelligence, then it's okay to, to show that. Um, Another year passes, and although the PCA is encouraged by more revisions, uh, problems of decorum remain, and it is not until 10 years later, and this brings it right up to um, Kurosawa's film, 1955, that the film is, uh, is made in England and then released in the U.S. Um, Joe Macbeth begins, in that sense, a trend that presents Shakespeare's play as a modern crime drama, various shades of noir. Similarly, Men of Respect, which is the other play I want to mention um, today briefly, uh, and Makbul, as, as Rob cited, uh, follow, follow in that. And I've uh, recently become aware of the, well, Scotland PA shows uh, a rather <laughs> oddball, comically dark, darkly comic version of the play. Uh, but in the Shakespeare Retold series of 2001, that joins the lineage via Scotland PA by showing again the plot of Macbeth placed into the competitive restaurant business. Fast food in Scotland PA and haute cuisine in the Shakespeare Retold. And both of those films pay homage to Joe Macbeth by naming their protagonists also Joe. So there's a, there's a strong family. Something about, uh, something about family has to do with, with Macbeth quite a bit. Um, the, two, the two, you're free to browse through this later. It's, I think, of limited interest. But at any rate, I like two things on the front of it. The first is the big slogan going down the left. The knife knows where to go. Just follow it. That is a, a quote from the, from the screenplay in which Lady Macbeth um, is encouraging Macbeth, and, and not unerotically. You know, you know what you want. You know how to get it. So what, what Macbeth wants at that moment and what he has to do to get it is to, to murder Duncan or the Duncan figure. Um, but it also plays into the play long, uh, Rob, is this, I think it's just a Macbethian bad faith in which he repeatedly decides I, he's not really in control of anything. He's not, he's, uh, the bell invites me. So I'm like some sort of Pavlovian uh, murderer, and I hear the bell, and I go, uh, I go kill Duncan, or they have tied me to the stake, et cetera. That's a bear baiting uh, reference, actually. Um, but that's the all-purpose they, the they who won't fix the pothole, the they who won't do something. Um, and Macbeth is, is always seeking a way, uh, sort of weaseling out of the fact that he is um, fully culpable of the uh, horrors in the in the film or in the play. Um, 
And the other, uh, this is far more disturbing to me, but over here in this little box on the right is the um, pitch to the, to the view, potential viewer. It's that story you've read about and what an exciting new movie it makes, positing the idea that no one has actually read Macbeth, <clears throat> but you've heard of it. So come and see, what, come and see it in, in our version. No one from English 150B would, would uh, qualify for that uh, because we teach Macbeth all the time. Um, so Joe Macbeth, I, I wanna switch a little bit of my terrain. I, well, actually I do wanna say something about it. Noir has its own sort of code, of course, and its own expectations and its own look and its own kind of um, language, the darkly comic again. And I culled a few of my favorite bits of dialogue from Joe Macbeth. I thought I'd just share them with you as an interlude. After uh, Joe, <clears throat> the Macbeth figure, has begun the film by executing a rival, he's a hitman, um, he phones his boss, and the boss is a little nervous, and he wants to be certain that Macbeth succeeded in uh, killing the enemy. And Macbeth says, uh, Joe Macbeth says to him, what do you want, his head? as proof, that is. Uh, Lily, Lady Macbeth in the film says, as after they've begun their ascent in society, this house is like a palace, Joe. And he replies, yeah, kind of empty though, because it's enormous and they have no, no family. Uh, Joe at one point observes Joe Macbeth to his wife, the job of kingpin never passed from one guy to another without a big funeral. And she says, you can't stop what's coming, Joe, you can only get in the way. And you feel that, that uh, fraught dynamic between the couple. Uh, there are moments, of course, where the play will tap into Shakespeare's original language. Uh, Rosie, who is the, again, the singular uh, witch figure, and she's a sort of fortune teller. Um, what's, done, what's to be done must be done, she says. Even you can't stop it. And uh, Joe Macbeth says, I don't want that hag around here anymore. So he doesn't like to hear that. Um, one more, uh, well, actually two more moments. Uh, when Duncan and Fleance, the Fleance Macduff combined character arrive at the new house to celebrate uh, with Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, the, his uh, uh, ascent. Duke or Duncan says, I like this house. The fresh air right off the lake gives it a sweet smell, which is a version of Duncan in the play saying, this castle hath a pleasant seat. The air nimbly and sweetly recommends itself unto our gentle senses. Um, and then Lenny Banquo in this case adds, did you ever see so many birds flying around outside? I guess they like it here. And the, and the avianism of Macbeth offshoots is a really extraordinary feature, I think. I mean, they were very prominent in the Cohen film, uh, of course, as uh, Rob said, moving in and out of some uh, sort of uh, Ovidian metamorphosis. And then um, Joe Macbeth uh, features them in various uh, places as well. Uh, finally, Angus, uh, who is the name of the Scottish butler in the home of the Macbeths, uh, and, and acts as the doorman also. He, he's hearing some knocking. We know where this comes from. And he says, knocking, knocking, always knocking. If I was a butler in hell, I wouldn't have to answer the door more often. And you find the, the attempts to channel the original language of the, of the play into this um, moment. Um, the biggest liberty Joe Macbeth takes with its source material is to try to answer a question that, that my students raise all the time, um, which is about the future. And that is, here is Malcolm, a ascendant. He's on his way to be, uh, to be crowned at, at Scone. And <clears throat> yet we all know that Fleance is somewhere out there and we all know that the witches are batting a thousand. And so somehow the, that will uh, have to come to pass. Um, the Joe Macbeth, solves isn't the right verb, but deals with this issue or this ambiguity, which is, I think, part of what makes the play so compelling, all the ambiguities, um, is, in, is, in this, uh, is in this figure. Essentially, it conflates the characters of Banquo and Macduff. Um, 
into Banky and his son in the film named Lenny. And that looks by positioning like that it would be Fleance, but actually Lenny has far more in common with Macduff. When Joe Macbeth hires some goons to, to wipe his rival out, uh, Banky, et cetera, they, they get only Banky and Lenny is, is spared somehow. Uh, but Lenny in the meantime has a wife and, a, and an infant and or a young child, we never, never quite see it. We see a baby carriage. Um, and uh, when Lenny shows up at the banquet, sitting next to his father's ghost at one point, um, Joe Macbeth decides he's got to uh, surprise that, that particular castle, which is a brownstone somewhere in New York, and, <clears throat> or filmed in, filmed in England though. Um, so he uh, then further murders take place, murders take place, and that gives uh, the character of Lenny um, even higher motivation to topple Joe Macbeth and also um, turning him into Fleance because he and he's the one who will finally kill, kill Macbeth. So it, it tries to deal with this by just wiping out one of the characters or absorbing them in. Uh, and as a result, the, la the last line in Joe Macbeth is uh, Angus, the, the uh, inevitable doorman, comes out and sees Lenny and says, I guess you're the new boss here. Um, and I'll, um, I'll, I'll, work, I'll keep working here in that. And Angus says, I mean, uh, sorry, Lenny says, no, Angus, this is the end of the line because he has no children, as it were, and there won't be any more um, uh, rivals that anybody can see at that point. Um, my students are interested in the future and how there will, what, who will be on the throne or in the, in the, the padrone at the, at the end of whatever film it is, but they're also interested in the past. And the thing that uh, grabs attention is Lady Macbeth's um, assertion that she had once nursed a child. And we get very, very involved in this. When, when did this happen? Is this news to Macbeth? Uh, what, why, how, how has she ended up in, to be the kind of character she is uh, at this point? <clears throat> a number of productions, and Throne of Blood deals with this very interestingly and ambiguously, furnish Lady Macbeth with a child, or the experience of pregnancy, or the loss of a child, or in, what, what is the one that begins with the funeral of the child, the, fa the fast bend. Yeah, the fast bender yeah. version. Yeah. yeah, the first scene you see is, is a, a, intended to be the funeral of, of the Macbeth child. Um, that child won't go away. <laughs> oh, okay. I, didn't, I haven't seen it. Uh, good to know. Um, Rob and I were reflecting on a production uh, of the UCLA Shakespeare group, uh, which put on Macbeth in 2014. And it began stunningly with a, a, a prologue dumb show, not, although it wasn't quiet, of a, a scene of a woman giving birth in labor, high volume, uh, the production of a child bloody with birth, uh, segueing into the first appearance of the bleeding captain or sergeant in the first, in act one, scene two of the play, uh, as if as if somebody had pushed fast forward and the, the, the child was still bloody, although now grown up. And you had a very strong image of the um, time scheme of the play and the future, past to future, and so on. Um, the second movie I wanted to quickly mention is called Men of Respect. Men of Respect came out in 1990. It pays instant homage to Joe Macbeth by filming its, showing a, its first scene from the outside of a neon lit restaurant named I think Mort's, but I couldn't quite make it out <laughs> fittingly. And, uh, and the Macbeth character makes a hit in that and that earns him promotion, et cetera, et cetera. Later in the film, we learn that uh, Ruthie, his wife um, had uh, it is strongly implied, um, aborted a child at his request because it was untimely. It was not in keeping with his career aspirations at that point. And so that gives her enormous uh, psychological and rhetorical leverage over Macbeth, the Macbeth figure, when he's trying not to, not, not to murder Duncan, 
look, we're doing okay now, and I'm, I'm not going to kill him. And she uh, plays that card. Um, there's a scene in which I think it's a very, in many respects, it's very mindful of its cinematic past. Rob was citing the, the moment where Washizu shouts, uh, fool, fool, to himself, which I think comes right after he's heard of the death of Lady Macbeth. Um, the comparable moment in Man of Respect is when um, Mikey <clears throat> Battaglia, who's the Macbeth figure, the names I'll have to refer somehow, uh, has discovered his wife, his wife's body, freshly uh, self-murdered, bleeding into the bath tub in which she earlier rinsed out the bloody clothes of Macbeth after he killed Duncan. And he is grieving powerfully. And then he leaves her and goes out and he sees himself in the mirror. And he says one word to himself. He screams it, idiot. And you feel very effectively, I think, the, the compression of, this, of the soliloquy tale told by into one word. We know where it is in the film. We know where we are in the original play. We know the original play. And it's, a, I think, a very deft uh, summary of, of the relationship between the two. I should, I should wind down. I think probably we're running out of time. Yes, OK. Um, so I don't, uh, I don't have really that much more to say except to uh, wish you happy hunting for all the Macbeth uh, <laughs> offshoots that exist in the world. They, they, uh, more than eight generations of them at this point, I think. So thank you. One, one story, just because this occurred to me very recently. You probably know there's a famous superstition among actors that you're not supposed to say the name of this play in a theater. Or if you do, something bad is going to say, they call it the Scottish play, to avoid that. You probably also know that a few weeks ago at the Oscars, Chris Rock said the name of the play in saying that Denzel Washington had been nominated for the play. And Moments later, he got smacked in the face by a guy whose name is Will S. So the dangerous magic of this play persists at the Dolby Theater even now. <laughs> <laughs>